Uh, Matthew chapter 14 in our Bibles today, and we're going to read just two verses to begin with, and then look at the majority of this passage as well as in Mark chapter 6. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, it says there, When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart, and when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Let's go ahead and bow and ask the Lord's blessing on the message this morning. Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you care about each and every one of us personally. Lord, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, and that you not only care for our eternal destiny, but Lord, you care about our day-to-day activities and the burdens that we face, the trials that we face, the life that you have given us to live. And Lord, I pray now as we look into your word, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, make your word real to us. I pray that you would reveal truth, apply it to our hearts. Lord, meet the needs in our lives. And Lord, help us not to be hearers of your word only, but help us to be doers of your word, to be obedient as to how you lead throughout this service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a bad day before? Yeah, that's one of those questions you don't really have to ask, right? We know the answer to that already. I remember one time I was in college, and I woke up late, and that's already, you know, not, that's a bad thing. Now, some of you might be used to that. There are some people who tend to just, you know, be fashionably late for everything. Uh, But I don't like to be late, and I woke up late that morning, and I missed the bus breakfast, and I missed the bus meeting, and it was snowing outside in Powell, Tennessee, which was very abnormal. And I hopped in my car, and I started to drive out to where my bus route was and where we visited every week, and I thought, well, I'll just meet up with the other workers once I get there. I know where they'll be about this time. And I started driving out there, not knowing that bus had been canceled that morning. And I got out there, and I grew up in northwest Indiana, just 10 miles away from Lake Michigan, and we got a lot of lake effect snow, and I was used to driving in snow, and it was no big deal. But I wasn't used to driving in the snow in a state that doesn't treat their roads. Or in a, straight, in a state that had hills. I lived in Indiana, all right? And so I was driving through these, this housing development in Knoxville, and I was coming down this hill, and the road had not been treated, and it was pure ice. And as I came down that hill, I hit a curb with my car. And the curb, for whatever reason, was about that tall. I don't know why anybody would build the curb that tall, but it was. And it ripped the tire right off the front of my car. I remember praying before I got out of the car and having wishful thinking that it wouldn't be too bad. But when I got out and the car was facing this way and the tire was facing that way, I knew I wouldn't be driving anymore that day. And so I waited for two hours in a snowstorm for the tow truck to come pick me up and to tow away my car. Afterwards, I found out that we did not have great insurance. In fact, we only had liability. And what that meant was that the insurance wasn't going to pay for my car to be fixed. And so I was behind on my school bill with a car that was undrivable because I woke up late on a day that it was snowing in Powell, Tennessee, and showed up to bus visitation not knowing that bus had been canceled. That was a kind of bad day. It wasn't the worst day of my life. I remember another day I woke up and I got ready to go to Saturday morning men's prayer meeting and I walked out my front door and I was going to hop in my car, but my car was not there. I thought, that's weird. (laughs) But sometimes we would leave one of our cars at the church and I thought, you know what, maybe I just left it at church and we rode home together yesterday and I'll drive in the church and And I'll see if it's there. And I drove in, and it wasn't sitting in the front parking lot. But I'm an optimist, so I drove around and thought, well, maybe it's in the back parking lot. I can't remember where we parked yesterday. And I drove around to the back, and it wasn't there either. And then I realized that my car was missing. So I got home, and I called the police to report my car stolen. Only it wasn't stolen. It was impounded because I didn't have my county sticker on it. The county sticker that I paid for that was sitting in the glove compartment of the car that was impounded. 
The worst part of that was knowing the conversation that would take place with my wife because I hadn't put the sticker on that she reminded me about so lovingly on numerous occasions. I had a basketball game that morning and I showed up to play in a men's basketball league and somebody threw a ball over my head. I jumped in the air and when I came down, I came down on somebody's foot and hurt my ankle. And my wife said, you need to go to the doctor. I said, no, it'll be all right. I tried to jog around at halftime. I tried to cut and shoot and realized I was useless, so I didn't go back in the game. But I thought, it's all right. I don't need to go to the doctor. I'll, I'll see how it is in a couple of days. But by the time we got to the car, I knew I needed to go to the doctor. So we drove to the place where the car was impounded and paid to get our car out. And then I put the sticker on and then drove to the doctor to find out that my ankle was broken and that I would be on crutches for the next few weeks. That wasn't a good day either. The truth of the matter is, those are things that we can laugh about, but some of us have had days worse than that. And we never know when we wake up in the morning what a day may bring. You know, as I was thinking about 2022 and looking back at the last two years that we've had, 2020, none of us ever would have guessed what happened in 2020. And by the end of 2020, we just assumed 2021 had to be better. It couldn't get any worse. But it brought some of its own challenges, didn't it? And the truth of the matter is we have no idea what 2022 will hold. But as we look at this passage today, a familiar passage, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, as we look at this passage today, I want you to see some lessons about life with me and some lessons about our Lord. I don't know what 2022 will hold, but I know this, that life can be difficult. But I also know this, God cares about us in our time of need. Amen. Look at verse 13 here in this passage. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart, and when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. When Jesus had heard of what? When he had heard that his cousin John the Baptist had been martyred. See, Jesus just found out that he had lost his cousin, and that's what led him out to the desert. Not only had he found out that he had lost his cousin, if you would bear with me as I read Mark chapter 6, verses 30 and 31, it says there, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. They had just come back from their first preaching tour, and they were trying to tell Jesus about all that had happened on this tour while they were away. And in verse 31 it says, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And so here's what hap has happened. The political scene and the scene towards John the Baptist, towards Jesus, it, it was changing. And so he sees that John the Baptist's life had already been taken, and he knew John was the forerunner for him, and he knew that John had already been taken in. It probably was a reminder to him of something that he knew all along, that his time was short as well. That soon he would be going to the cross, and soon he would be laying down his life for us. And Jesus knew what had just happened to John, and he knew where he was headed. And he also knew that his disciples had been away, and that they were tired, and that they needed rest. And as he tried to speak to them, there were many distractions and many interruptions. And so he says, we need to get away, because not only did he know the need in his own life, but he saw the need in his disciples' lives. He said, we need to get away, and you need to find some rest. We know that God cares about us, if for no other reason, because He came. Romans 5.8, but God commendeth, or God showed, or God proved His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.12 says, wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We were all born sinners. But God looked down at us in our sinful state and loved us so much that he, sent to, he decided to send His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. You've heard it said before, if our greatest need had been information, He would have sent an educator. If our greatest need were technology, He would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, He would have sent 
an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So he sent a Savior. Jesus in John 14, 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 10, 9, he said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. And if you're under the sound of my voice today, whether in this room or listening on the radio or or tuning in via live stream, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's never a time that you have reached the point of salvation. I want you to know today that God cares about you. The most well-known verse and most popular verse in the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But that passage goes on to say, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. You know, when we realize that we're a sinner and we realize that He's a Savior, then all we have to do is repent of our sins and call out to Him for salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10.10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If we knew for no other reason than the fact that God sent His Son to earth for us, we would know that would be enough. God cares about us. Because He cared about the greatest need that we have ever had. But the truth is, He doesn't just care about our eternal destiny. He also cares about our day-to-day living. You know, the choir sometimes sings a song called, Does Jesus Care? And if Brother Ty were in tune with the Holy Spirit and right with God, that's what they would have sung this morning. Because it would have worked with my message. I'm just joking. That choir is always such a blessing. And they sing such wonderful songs that teach doctrine and minister to our hearts and prepare us. Not only praise the Lord, but prepare our hearts for the preaching of God's Word. I'm thankful for our music that we have here at Cranberry Baptist Church. This song, Does Jesus Care, has these words. Does Jesus care when burdens press me, when days of grief seem more than I can bear, when storm clouds gather all around me? Does Jesus care? Oh, does He care? Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, He cares. His heart is touched with my anxiety. Through storms of life, I know He cares for me. My Jesus cares for me. We know He cares because He came, but we also know He cares because He told us so in His Word. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. There is no doubt that God cares about you and I. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Be careful or be worried or be fretful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hebrews 4, 14 and 16, 14 and through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God cares about our needs. God has given us an outlet when we are burdened. He says, come to me. Cast your cares upon me. Pray to me, and I will give you a peace that passeth all understanding. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There are times in this life where we go through difficulties. There are times in this life where we go through trials and tribulations, where we suffer loss, we suffer heartache, we suffer hurt, and in those instances there are times we can get under the situation and under the burden and I've heard pastors saying before when somebody says well I'm just under a lot right now I'm under a lot of stress I'm under burden right now I've heard people say well what are you doing under there because God says if you have that burden cast it on him 
Come to Him with those needs. Come to Him with those prayers. Lay out your heart. Pour out your heart before Him. And allow Him to give you the peace and the rest that you so desire. So Jesus takes them aside to a desert place so they can get some rest. But of course, we know what happens. We know that when they went aside to get that rest, there were many people there. Verse 14 says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and He healed their sick. Matthew 6, 32-34 says, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately, and the people saw them departing. And many knew Him and ran afoot thither out of all the cities and outwent them and came together unto Him. And Jesus, when He came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And He began to teach them many things. So we're told in both passages, He shows up there and the people are there. And when he sees the people, and he sees the state of the people as their sheep without a shepherd, his, his response is that he has compassion on them. And we know that that's not just merely a feeling of sympathy. It's not just, I, I feel so sorry for those people, I wish somebody would do something for those people. But rather it's seeing the need and deciding to meet the need. To, to put himself out to help them in the midst of their troubles. And so he teaches them, and he heals them, and he does this all day long. And what I know is this, life has difficulties, but God cares about us, and he cares about our needs in the midst of those difficulties. And I know this as well, while 2022 might bring some difficulties, I know it's also going to bring many opportunities. There are always ministry opportunities available. And God desires to use you and to use me to meet the needs of others. We see that here in this passage. The disciples were tired. They had been interrupted. They were getting apart for some time alone with the Savior. And Jesus had just heard of the loss of his cousin. And in the midst of all of this, there's an opportunity to minister. And what that tells me is that ministry doesn't always come at an opportune time. In other words, ministry opportunities sometimes are inconvenient. They come at inconvenient times. Ministry doesn't just happen on Sundays from 10 to 12 or at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Ministry doesn't just happen from 9 to 5 on Monday through Friday. And I, for one, am happy that we have a pastor who understands that. I told the teens this morning, that unfortunately there are some pastors who believe that the full extent of their ministry is what they present in this pulpit or their pulpit. They don't want to counsel. They don't want to disciple. They don't want to deal with the hurts. They want the paycheck. They want the preaching. But for whatever reason, they don't see the ministering of needs outside of the church house. And I think we should be thankful that we don't have a pastor like that and we don't have a pastor's wife like that. And the truth of the matter is I've served under numerous pastors and I'm thankful that I've been under men who understand that ministry doesn't just happen when you're on the clock or happen on the Lord's Day. And it's not just the pastors or the paid staff who understand that. I'm thankful to be part of a church family that understands that. Amen. Of people who love one another, who bear one another's burdens, and who understand that even though sometimes it sacrifices my time or my treasures or it, it takes a little bit out of my schedule or makes my life a little bit more difficult, there are people in this church who understand that you have a family in Christ and that you bear one another's burdens, that you love one another, that you help one another, and that you serve one another. Amen. Ministry rarely comes at the opportune time, and ministry doesn't always happen in the church house. There are people all around us who have great needs. There are people who've lost their health, and people who've lost their job, people who've lost a loved one, and people who've lost their way. 
There are people who are looking for answers at the bottom of a bottle or people who are trying to drown their sorrows, people who are trying to numb their pain. There are people who are hurting. There are people who are hopeless. There are people whose hearts are filled with hate and people whose hearts are filled with despair. I served for 17 years under a man who's not a stranger to this ministry, under Pastor Michael Edwards, and I'm thankful for the influence that he had on my life and on my family. And I don't remember every sermon that he preached, but I still remember the first sermon he preached. I was a student at the Crown College of the Bible in Powell, Tennessee, and they had a Bible conference under the tent, which means it probably was raining, and there was probably a flood under our feet at the time. And I remember Pastor Edwards got up and he preached a sermon on serving our own generation. Talking about the life of David. And he gave an illustration that sticks with me till this day. And he said, if you draw a circle with Cranberry Baptist Church in the center of it, and you draw a circle out in a 10 mile radius in every direction, that you can find all manner of hurts within that radius. There are people within that radius who are questioning whether or not life is worth even living. There are people in that radius who have made mistakes that they greatly regret. Young ladies who are trying to decide whether or not they're going to have that baby or get rid of that baby. There are people with addictions There are people going through family breakups. There are all sorts of problems within that radius. And those are the people that we're called to minister to. Ministry is not always convenient. Ministry is not always easy. And ministry is sometimes messy. But if we're to be like our Savior, we have to be servants and have a heart to minister. So while there will be difficulties probably this year, we have a God who cares about our needs. And there will be opportunities to minister, and God wants to use us to meet the needs of others around us. But in meeting those needs, there are times that we will lack the resources needed to accomplish the job. But I'd like to remind you that little is much when God is in it. We serve a God who can multiply our limited resources. David should not have been able to kill Goliath with a sling and a stone. But he was able to take down that warrior with a sling and a stone. Jail, a lady with a hammer and a nail for her tent, took down Sisera, the great and mighty captain of the Canaanite army. Gideon, going into battle against almost 135,000 men with his 300, What great weapons did God give Gideon? Did they have swords and shields? Did they have chariots? What did they have? They had a pitcher and a lamp and a trumpet. And they took down the mighty Midianites. What I'm saying is God can use whatever he has entrusted with us with. He can use whatever he's placed in our hand. And just like he was able to use jail and the nail and Gideon with the trumpet and the pitcher and the lamp and David with the sling, he was able to use five little loaves and two small fish to feed over 5,000 people. He was able to take those limited resources and to multiply them in a great way. And I would say that God wants us to use the limited resources that he has given us. God wants us to be a part of his work. You realize that God, Jesus, did not need the five loaves and two fish to feed these people. You realize that, right? That he could have made bread of the stones if he wanted to. Or he could have spoken food into existence. But he wanted to let that little lad and the disciples be part of the work that he was getting ready to accomplish. He wants us to be a part of his work and he wants us to offer him what little we have so he can use it to accomplish his will. He wants us to offer our time and our talents, our treasures, our opportunities, our connections. You realize that you have opportunities to reach people and you know people that I may never meet. 
And I know people that you may never meet. We don't all get the same opportunities in life, but we all get the opportunity to serve him and to be faithful to what he leads us to do. And so he wants us to use what little we have so he can use us to accomplish his will. He wants us to offer all that we have to him and see what he can do with it. Because he can do much more with it than we can. You know, I think sometimes we can be all too much like Gideon and Moses. Like Gideon who said, I, I think you found the wrong guy. You, you realize why I'm ha- hiding back here, right? Like Moses who said, no, 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 God, send whoever you will, but, but, but not me. They won't believe my message. I don't even know who to tell them sent me. I, 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 I'm not very eloquent. I don't, I don't speak very well. God, God I, I believe you can do it, but I can't. I, 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 I can't do it. You can't use me to do that, God. You see, we can come up with all sorts of excuses like the disciples did here. What was the disciples' solution when it became dinner time? Send everybody home, Jesus. So we can get that rest you were talking about. You see, Jesus, there's not any Chick-fil-A's out here in the deserts. We don't have enough food to feed these people, and we don't have enough money to buy them food. We just need to send them away. And Jesus says, no, no, have them seated, and I want you to feed them. And then, of course, they bring this young lad. And this young lad has limited resources, but he gives everything he has to God. God knows how limited we are, but he can use us. He just wants us to take what we have and give it to him and say, God, would you please use it? The Christian life is a life of faith. Mark eleven twenty two, 22, Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. Hebrews 10, 38, now the just shall live by faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In this passage, we see that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples some lessons. He was trying to teach them about faith. He wanted them to see that, yes, their needs were great and the needs of others around them were great, but Jesus knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly how to meet those needs, and he is able to meet every need that we have. As we look at the second story in this passage, we see that Jesus uses a storm to continue his lesson about faith. It would be nice in life if we never had to go through storms. It would be nice in life if every day were easy. If we never had to face heartache or difficulties. And there are times in life where we look at life and we say, I just wish life could be a little bit easier. Why does life have to be so hard do other people have it as difficult as I do and here's the truth of the matter there are some people in this world who would teach a false doctrine that as long as you are right with God you will never get sick and God will make you wealthy and and everything will be breezy and easy for the rest of your life they teach a health and wealth gospel that's not found in this book Because as we look in this book, we find out that it was Jesus who constrained them to get in the ship. And it was Jesus who sent them out into the storm. Why? Because there's lessons that can be learned in the midst of the storm. That whole time that they were in the storm, what was Jesus doing? He was praying. Look with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 14. I'll turn back over there. Verse 25, or sorry, let's look at verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples again to a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain 
apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now if you would, turn with me to Mark chapter 6. And we'll look at the same story from another gospel perspective in Mark chapter 6. Verse 46, And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And look at verse number 48. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Jesus was not confused about where they were or what they were going through. The whole time that they were in the midst of the sea, in the midst of the storm, he was praying for them, and he could see them. He was watching over them. They felt alone. They were trusting in their own ability to get back to shore, and their ability wasn't enough to get them there. But that whole time, they were never alone because God was watching over them the whole time. I'm thankful that Jesus is still praying for his followers today because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. What a blessing it is that we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And not only is Jesus praying for us, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings which can't even be uttered with man's mouth. There is a God who not only sees us where we are and knows where we are, but is praying for us in the midst of those struggles. Watching over us in the midst of those difficulties. He knew exactly where they were and what they were going through. And though they felt alone, he was watching over them the whole time. And then he came to them in the midst of the storm, in the midst of their need. The truth is, you and I never have to face a storm alone because he's promised that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. We don't go through anything alone because he is always with us. In the midst of the storm, he is always there. He is always real. He is always powerful. He is always able. He is always present. Our God is there for us in the midst of the most difficult times of life. Amen. And in these moments, He can step into that storm. And sometimes He allows us to row for longer than we would like. Sometimes He allows us to feel like we're alone longer than we would like. Sometimes He allows us to struggle before he shows up. But in the midst of that storm, he came walking to them on the water. Now why are these two stories connected? Because it's the same exact lesson. It's a lesson on faith. God was trying to increase their faith because John the Baptist had just been martyred. Jesus is going to go to the cross soon. And soon there's coming a day where he's physically not going to be present with the disciples anymore. They won't be able to see him physically. They won't be able to touch him. They won't be able to talk to him. They won't have what they had in that moment. Now he's going to tell them that something more beneficial is coming because the comforter is going to come and he's going to indwell them. I know that and you know that. But imagine how scary it had to be for them to think when Jesus was going to be taken away from them. And he was trying to teach them to have faith. To have faith in the impossible. To have faith that God is working even in the difficult times. To have faith that God can use somebody even as feeble and as limited as I am. To have faith that God is doing a great, miraculous work and I get to be a small part of it. What a blessing it is. So why does God give us this account in Scripture? He was trying to, to strengthen the disciples' faith, and the truth is we have this recorded for us so that it can strengthen our faith. 
Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And just as He had a work for His disciples, He has a work for us. So as we enter a new year, will we face some difficulties? Probably. But it's also going to be filled with many opportunities. Opportunities to learn more about God and opportunities to be used of God and opportunities to make a difference in the lives of others around us. And if we will offer to God all that we have and live by faith, we will have the opportunity to see God work miracles. It's interesting that in the middle of a storm is when man walked on water. It was in the middle of that storm when Peter saw Jesus walking on water where Peter asked, bid me to come unto you. Can I walk on water also? It was in the midst of the storm that his faith was strong. He said, oh, no, no. You don't know the end of the story. His faith's not strong. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. He starts to seek. He has to cry out for help. Yes, we're fallible. But he took a step of faith that nobody else in the history of man has ever taken. He stepped out of the boat. And I am convinced that in the days ahead, God wants us to take similar steps of faith. He wants us to believe that he is still all-powerful and he is still capable of doing miracles and he still wants to do miracles and we need to trust him to do things that only he can do with our lives. So I'll end with a handful of questions. Have you been living, believing a lie as if God doesn't care? You might sit here and say, I'm in church on a Sunday morning. I have my Bible with me. What do you mean have I been living as if God doesn't care? There are times where we can live outside of reality and start to entertain wrong thoughts and act as if God doesn't care about our needs. And I'm telling you, whether your flesh is telling you that or whether the devil's attacking you, I am telling you that is a lie because the Scripture clearly teaches that God cares about you personally. Second question I would ask you is, are there areas of your life that you're holding back from God? You see, that boy would have missed out on the blessing had he not been willing to give it all to Jesus? Are there areas of your life that you're holding back that you haven't offered over to Jesus? Maybe you're still in that point that Moses was in where you're arguing with God, saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. If that's the case, look at this passage and say, I can't, but God can. Or just be biblical and say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. To say I can't is a lie and a lack of faith. To say I can is arrogant and foolish and wrong. But to say I can do all things through Christ is to live in obedience and to live in faith. Are there parts of your life that you're holding back from God that you haven't given over to Him? When is the last time that you took a step of faith? When is the last time where you stepped out of the boat and said, if God doesn't do something here, I'm going to fall flat on my face? God, you've led me to do this. I'm trusting you in this. And by faith, though I don't understand how it's going to work out and I can't see all the details and I'm fearful to even follow what you're leading me to do. By faith, I'm going to step out, God, And I'm going to trust that you're going to use this, that you're going to do something that I can't do. Last question I'd ask you is, are you trusting, are you still trusting God to do the miraculous? I believe we still serve a miracle working God who wants to do miracles in our lives today. I believe that with all of my heart. God is not out of the miracle business. He still wants to do the miraculous today. You know, I'm glad that blind Bartimaeus didn't give up on a miracle when he was young. You know, he wasn't healed until he was an adult. 
What if he would have given up on it as a youngster? How about that man by the pool of Bethesda? He never gave up hoping for a miracle, did he? What about that woman who touched Jesus' garment, who had the issue of blood for years? She never gave up trusting that God could do a miracle in her life. And I'm telling you today that God can do a miracle through His children today. He could turn this world upside down like He did in the first century church. He can turn this country back to God and bring about revival. God's still in the miracle working business. And we need to trust God with what little we have. Hand it back to Him and say, God, I don't have much to offer you. But what I have, it's yours. And God, I'm trusting you to do something with it that I can never do on my own. Are you trusting God in 2022 to take your life and still use it to do something special? Not because you're special, but because everything you have belongs to him. And he's special. And he wants to use you to accomplish his will. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. Stand to our feet as the piano gets ready to play. I'll ask you those four questions again. I don't normally do this, but is there anyone in here who would say, would you pray for me about that first question? I've been struggling so much. I know God cares, but but sometimes I get discouraged and I get under the burden and I need to start remembering that God cares. How many say, would you pray for me about that? I know God cares, but I've been under that burden and I need to get out. I need to cast those cares on the Lord. How many say, are there areas of your life that, there's, that you're holding back from God. You say, there's something in my life that God is talking to my heart about that I need to give to Him. It might be a sin area. It might be a talent. It might be a, a, a commitment towards a ministry or showing up to witness, whatever it might be. But there's something that you haven't been doing for the Lord. And you say, God pinpointed that today as you were preaching. There's something that I have been holding back that I need to offer to the Lord. And, and God spoke to my heart about that. I want to be obedient. Would anybody raise your hand and say that this morning? I see those hands. How many say, God spoke to my heart about needing to take a step of faith and needing to trust God to do miraculous and just be obedient and doing what He has called me to do? How many would raise your hand and say that? I need to, I need to take a step of faith this morning. I think it's beneficial for us not just to raise our hands. I'll pray for those hands in just a moment. But I would ask you to deal with those things during this time of invitation. Whether that's taking a seat right there where you are or coming to the front seat and sitting up here if you're not able to kneel or coming to an old-fashioned altar and getting on your face before the Lord. If God spoke to your heart, I would encourage you to do business with Him in just a moment when the piano begins to play. Father, we thank You for the service, for the way You spoke to hearts, for the truths that are contained in Your Word. We thank You that You have a desire to use us. Lord, I've never done anything in my life worthy to be used of You. It is amazing that because of your grace and your love, you stoop down to save a soul like mine. You've allowed me to be your son, and you've allowed me to be in your service. Lord, I pray for these hands that have been raised. Lord, for those who are under it right now, who are struggling. Lord, I know that there are real struggles in life and difficulties, heartaches and pain. Lord, I pray that you not only provide grace that's sufficient for those needs, but Lord, that they would cast those cares upon you, not entertain wrong thinking. Lord, I pray for others who raise their hand and say, there's, there's something God spoke to my heart about that I need to give over to the Lord. I've been holding back. Lord, I pray that they'd be doers of your word, that they'd be obedient. And then, Lord, many of us need to exercise our faith and just be obedient to do what you've called us to. Help us to be obedient even during this time of invitation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.